What is shaking, everybody? Welcome to the Wind Up Podcast. We are getting into a grape economy discussion today. It is going to be an interesting one based on a preliminary report and also final reports that we get at the beginning of every year about the prior grape harvest and what was picked, how much it cost, what sugar levels were, all kinds of geeky details around harvest reporting and what wines are being made from what grapes. Before we dive in to all of the nitty gritty details there, a couple of quick updates. Number one, thank you all for your immense patience over the last couple of weeks between storms and power outages and internet outages. It has been an absolute bear trying to get episodes edited, uploaded, and sent out. Uh, we're doing a few things now kind of on the in the background to alleviate that should it come to pass again during winter seasons or even during trips or harvest uh, when our schedule tends to get a little bit crazy. So we apologize for the lack of episodes over the last couple of weeks, but we have a lot of fun stuff coming down the pipeline. Uh, I've also been mentioning having guests on the show. We're ironing that out as well. Uh, we've scouted a good location to be able to do that where it's quiet, where we can have a good kind of honest and upfront conversation with anyone who joins us and hopefully answer a bunch of the questions and give you all more information on the world of wine, winemaking, hospitality, and all that good stuff. Uh, we're just confirming that actually this evening. Uh, so we'll have that all dialed in. We'll be able to start recording episodes with guests in the coming weeks. So been doing a whole lot of work to make sure that we do that correctly. Um, it's definitely been something I've been teasing for the last few months. Many of you are well aware of that. And it is something that, you know, given that we've been going at this podcast now for a almost full calendar year, if we're going to add on something like this, uh, which means, you know, maybe additional microphones, cameras, uh, making sure that the locale looks good for YouTube. Thank you for all those watching on YouTube. Uh, we want to make sure it's done well. So it has taken a little bit more time in terms of kind of the R&D and making sure that everything's going to be lined up to knock it down. Uh, that way we can do it the right way and give you guys all the content that you want to get. So uh, thank you all so much for the continued support. Uh, please if uh, make sure to uh, subscribe on YouTube, any of our social networks, Instagram, the Book of Face, and the social network formerly known as Twitter. At uh, uh, MTGA Wines will be the place to do that. Uh, be sure if you have a little spare moment uh, to rate and review the podcast that is a huge help in terms of the algorithm and getting the show kind of out and about so wherever you're consuming your podcasts um, it's very very helpful to get that just little star rating taken care of or even if you have a nice thing to say or even a critique we'll take that too uh, we'll be very very appreciative of all that so announcements complete let's go ahead and dive into today's episode now I mentioned that there's a report that comes out at the beginning of each year, and this is a report that is done by the state of California. Um, as many of you may expect, uh, California requires us to do quite a bit of reporting uh, on our operations as a wine business. One of those things is a harvest and grape crush report, and I'll be sure to show you guys a lot of these links. Um, this actually goes all to the USDA uh, and the CDFA, uh, which are pick your alphabet agency that manages all this and compiles this information from all kinds of producers. Uh, it breaks down a grape harvest in terms of the Appalachians and the different districts specifically that those grapes are coming from. So whether it's Napa, Sonoma, Central California, the Central Coast, Northern Northern California, down South, uh, there's all kinds of places that grapes are grown in the state of California, much like any other state. And that is broken down into the following map. Let me go ahead and reduce my camera size here ever so slightly. Boom, there we go. Uh, so this map, and for those of you that are interested in more of this stuff and want to just kind of see how this is all broken down, uh, there is a link in the description of this video. You can check this out. It is pretty nerdy government-like stats and reports, so it's really not that interesting to read because uh, if you scroll down it's literally just kind of graph and table and table and table and table uh, but some of the information that we'll be covering is going to be very very interesting in terms of how things have trended over the last 10 years basically in terms of grape growing so that's where i really want the perspective and kind of the show to go today 
Now, uh, you can see all the different colors on the map here represent the different areas. There are 17, count them, 17 different grape growing districts within the state of California. And if you zoom in ever so slightly and scroll down a little bit, you can see Napa right here, good old number four. Um, you have Mendocino, Lake County, Sonoma, Napa. You have, in essence, the entirety of Northern California, this big green section up here. Um, and then everything else kind of broken down. You have this number 17 here, which also kind of shows you this intersection in and around the Sacramento area. And then, of course, all the way down towards L.A., San Bernardino, San Diego, uh, the Central Coast here between Monterey, uh, uh, Slow, Santa Barbara, Ventura, all that good stuff. Uh, I want to definitely make note that this doesn't necessarily align with the appellations that you see on a wine label. Uh, for example, uh, you'll see Napa is broken out here in number four, but you don't see any of the sub appellations. So you're not going to see St. Helena. You're not going to see Rutherford. You're not going to see Stag's Leap. It's just Napa Valley as a whole to kind of weight the averages of grapes across the entire county rather than breaking it down even further. Uh, but very typically, those appellated you know, selections of grapes tend to be a little bit more expensive than just kind of the unincorporated Napa Valley, but we'll get into more of that later. So this breaks it out for us so that when it comes time to work through grape contracts, which is something we are doing this week, as a matter of fact, we have a reference point of what not just ourselves, but everybody else is paying for their grapes. So for producers like us that are sourcing their fruit and working with other growers to make their wines, uh, from their grapes since we don't own our own vineyard. This is always a benchmark to help us figure out what we need to be paying and kind of what is a fair price for the grapes that we're purchasing. And we'll show you that in some of these reports, people are paying just astronomical prices and skewing this report immensely. Um, and some people are getting away, you know, with paying very little for their grapes, which would be a great deal, uh, depending for that person who's buying them, all said and done. And I want to start with kind of going through, and we're going to focus really on Napa. So district number four, we are in fact district number four. And we're going to be talking about Cabernet Sauvignon specifically because it is the juggernaut in the room. We talk about it all the time out here of Cabernet is king. And so we're going to start right there. Now, keep in mind that much of what we're going to talk about in terms of Cabernet is going to apply to a lot of other varieties as well. Uh, the numbers won't be exactly the same. I'll give you a couple examples of that. But you're going to see kind of the same trend across Napa Valley over the course of the reports that I've kind of pulled up to sh give you an example of what we're dealing with when it comes to the dollars and cents of buying wine grapes anywhere in California, but specifically Napa Valley, California. All right, so uh, for those of you that are following along on YouTube, I have my visual aids here uh, that we'll be utilizing. I'm gonna move my camera ever so slightly just to give you a little bit more of the screen view there. Um, and I'll kind of zoom in and highlight some stuff for you to key in on. Uh, for those of you just listening, I'll try and describe this to the best of my ability. Uh, I'll leave some timestamps uh, as well. So if you want to go back and kind of check out some of these reports and how they, you know, you know wh what I'm looking at when I'm talking about it and you want to pull them up yourself on your computer or cell phone, wherever the case may be, you can do just that. So I'll try and make sure that this episode's pretty, you know, well organized so you can geek out kind of to your heart's delight when it comes to the reports that we're talking about. So first things last. Uh, this most recent year, we're going to actually cover last but not least. I want to go back in time for a little bit, a little bit closer to when we were really just getting started and kind of getting a foothold within the wine industry. Uh, but we're going to go back to the mid-2010s, and that is the 2014 Grape Report. This is page actually number, I believe, 66 in the report. Let me scroll down just a little bit. Um, but let me zoom this back out. So, whoop. so 
Grape Crush Report Final 2014. Uh, so this came out in the early part of 2015. All those reports were submitted. We knew exactly what people were paying for the grapes. And this is basically how it's done. Is that come every February and into March, we get these final reports of like, hey, here are all the nitty gritty details of everything that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the show in terms of the different regions, the color coding changes for some reason every year. I couldn't tell you why. Um, they thank us. They tell us exactly how many grapes were crushed uh, over the course of all these different years. Um, this is thousands of tons. So you can see that in 2014, there were a lot of grapes crushed. And that does count for California as a whole, not just Napa. Napa is a much much smaller segment of that all said and done. Uh, but there is actually some really interesting information. And I mean, 2014, that's over 4.1 million tons of grapes crushed. Uh, for a little bit of perspective, Brittany and I probably crush about 20 tons on average every year. So it's, you know, a rounding error <laughs> based on the amount of grapes that are actually grown and produced here in California. So a little bit of perspective on kind of what that number actually means. Although you do see like in this report, you do see that that number was actually down 12% from the prior year, which happened to be a record high as of 2013. That was the record high at 4.7 million tons of grapes crushed in California. So there's actually some really interesting information of like the grand scheme of the wine industry, what's being produced and actually how much of it's being produced uh, within the state of California, not just Napa specifically. So you can kind of drill down into this. I mean, if you, you're a nerd and you love kind of statistics and a good spreadsheet like I do, you're going to be all about this report because it's going to be fascinating to read through and how this industry kind of happens uh, at scale you know, within the state of California. But let's head back down to page number 66, kind of what I wanted to focus on. And again, we're talking Cabernet Sauvignon. And actually, I'll show you guys kind of where we're starting here. 47, 57. If only this program, this is the beauty of, you know, their spreadsheets. Is there's not like a way to sort through the actual pages you have to scroll. Oh, actually, maybe I can. Let's, let's try this, 66. Oh, it did. That's so cool. Hey, give the government some credit. They actually know how to do this somewhat, kind of, not really. Anyway, so what I'm scrolling through right here, and let me zoom in a little bit. This is District 4, which is uh, Snapa, California. And this is Cabernet Sauvignon that was crushed in 2014. So you can see the list just goes on and on for pages and pages. Cabernet Sauvignon is king. Basically, it starts here's the end of the Cabernet Franc section. Uh, which, you know, you're, there's basically the price that people were paying for Cabernet Franc, but we're going to look at that for Cabernet Sauvignon, which starts right about here. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six pages of Cabernet Sauvignon and basically the base price per ton. That's what you can see right here, kind of at the top of these pages. And then the tons that were purchased at that price. So you can see down here, as you see, the numbers definitely ascend as you go further and further down the report, meaning that people were paying more and more as you go down this. So for example, this fine person right here bought 9.4 tons of Cabernet at $13,000 a ton. So quick math, everybody. I got to break out a calculator for this because I am not that good at math in my head and I'd rather have a machine do it for me. To all the elementary school teachers that said, you'll never have a calculator on you at all times, this one's for you. So 9.4 times 13,000, right? You're looking at $122,000 just for that one grape purchase of Cabernet Sauvignon. Kind of nuts, right? Reasons why grapes as well as barrels are the two biggest cost centers for us winemakers. Uh, them is the ropes, as they say. So. But that is just one data point within this report. If you get to the end of the Cabernet Sauvignon section, you can see that just under 40,000 tons of Cabernet were produced or crushed during the 2014 season. The average price for that tonnage, and by the ton, 2,000 pounds, this is the average price per ton. And it is a weighted average based on the number of tons, right, crushed at that price. So luckily that is factored in here. Um, but you can see the average price is a little under $6,000. You're talking 5920 bucks basically, per ton. So you can see that person that paid 13000 that we mentioned, 
paying easily time and a half what the average is, right? Kind of crazy. But that's what you see, you know, in certain data points, right? You're going to have even people that are paying if you scroll back up ever so slightly. You have someone that bought 14 tons of Cabernet and they were paying $35,000 per ton. So 14.6 times 35,000, you're looking at half a million dollars for that Cabernet. That's a pretty good chunk of change, especially considering that 35,000 divided by, let's call it 6,000, just to be somewhat generous, is 5.8 times the average price, more, almost six times the average price. And this is 10 years ago. This isn't even recent history as far as we're concerned anymore. This is like historical data of what's going on. But we're gonna ignore kind of the outliers for this purpose, because they definitely have an impact on the overall average, but this weighted average based on the total tons, that's the big number we wanna focus on when it comes to this report because that's gonna give you a pretty good idea of how to haggle you know, based on your grape prices, right? Because if you're buying grapes and your grower is saying, hey, we wanna work with you again this year and we wanna charge you $13,000 a ton, you're like, okay, well, the average price is just under 6K, so why do I need to pay you an extra $7,000 a ton for your grapes? And you have to you know, figure out if that juice is quite literally worth the squeeze in that situation. So these are part of the conversations that we have as grape buyers during this time of year, is sorting out exactly what fruit we need and what we want in our program, but also the price that we're gonna be paying by the ton for it. So this is the 2014 example. Let's fast forward a few years, shall we? So this here, uh, this will actually be the 2020 final grape crush report. So this was published in 2021. So just a couple short years ago. Now you'll notice that 2020 for us, and many of you probably remember, happened to be our fire season. It was a year where far less grapes were actually produced. So it was close to about just under 40,000 tons of Cabernet produced in 2014. You can see here that there was about 25 and a half thousand. So a pretty big drop off, but that makes sense because just less grapes were harvested during that season. So it does account for kind of these, you know, peaks and, you know, valleys in terms of overall production when it's all said and done, right? Now, what's interesting though, is that given the challenges of that year, we saw a pretty big jump in overall price per ton for Cabernet. So we're looking at about $6,000 a ton, right? In 2014. In 2020, you're at about 6,500 a ton. So realistically, 500 bucks, you know, divided by 6,000, you're looking at about a 8% or so jump in price when it's all said and done. Not huge, you figure over the course about five years or so, all right, there's gonna be some price increases. That's about a six year difference, right? So realistically, you expect some prices to go up, especially as the demand for Napa wines, Cabernet in particular, continues to rise. Now, what gets really interesting, if we fast forward a little bit further, and this is where we get to last year. Last year, 2023, a glorious year, one of the best years that we've had in a good long time in many of our opinions. But look at the jump that we have here in terms of the weighted average based on total tons. The total tonnage actually more than doubled. So it went from this 25K number in 2020, obviously an anomaly due to the fires, but it obviously surpassed the 2014 numbers as well. Uh, so that's 16K, you had 56,000 tons of Cabernet crushed from Napa in 2023. The average price per ton, $9,079. So you had 6,500 just a few short years ago, right? So you're looking at a $2,500 increase divided by 6,500, you're talking about a 38% price jump in the price of Cabernet Sauvignon over the last four years. Huh. Well, three years, because 2023, right? So that's where things start to get really interesting, right? 
And this is a trend that you might see across a handful of other varieties, particularly in the Napa Valley. Uh, we all know, we've talked a lot about it on this show of just the expense of what goes into making a bottle of wine. Now, let's put this into a little bit of perspective. This is something that I've definitely gone through, but for those of you that might be new to the show or just need a quick refresher, this is what that $9,000 price tag means to the cost of the bottles that you are buying. Now, keep in mind that this is only for the grapes. This doesn't include labor. This doesn't include corks. This doesn't include barrels. It doesn't include the glass bottles. It doesn't include keeping the lights on. It doesn't include anything else. This is purely for the raw material of the grapes themselves. And just for easy math, you typically get about two barrels per ton of grapes, right? So you can say, all right, let's take that $9,000. We'll round down just a little bit for easy math and divide that by two. So you're paying about $4,500 per barrel, right? And now you're getting about 300 bottles per barrel, right? So divide that by 300. And you're looking at a $15 cost basis for your wine, just for the grapes. And that's if you're paying the average price, right? So that's where the cost of your grapes is going. It's saying, all right, it's going to make, it's going to cost you at least just for the raw materials, $15 per bottle that you're producing. Now you're going to have to add on probably some new French oak barrels, which is going to add probably four to five dollars. Uh, American oaks a little cheaper. Maybe you get those for like three dollars added cost to that bottle of wine. You're going to have to get your labels printed. You're going to have to buy glass bottles to put it in when it comes bottling. You have to pay for that bottling. Uh, you're going to have to pay for storage. You're going to have to pay for your staff. You're going to have to pay all these other things. It's very easy to see how the cost of a bottle of wine just ramps up so, so quickly uh, here in Napa because of just where you're starting out at with the cost of your grapes. Now, let's look at a couple of the extremes from this particular year. We mentioned a few of them where someone was paying close to $35,000 one year. Someone else was paying closer to $25,000 in 2014. The top end price someone paid allegedly for 7.1 tons of grapes, they were paying $67,000 per ton. Whew, that just hurts thinking about it, to be completely honest. That ends up to just under half a million bucks. But obviously that's a $30,000 bump for the most expensive grapes at the time in the county from 2020 to 2023. Crazy. And if you scroll through this section, this is on page 73 of the preliminary 2023 crop report, you can see that basically you have this page, this page, this page, you have three, four pages of purchasing before you even start to see people get close to the average price. And then you see a handful of folks that are paying maybe a little less than 9,000. There's a few folks that are paying in the uh, six to 7,000 range. There's even a handful of people that are paying, you know, a few thousand dollars uh, depending. And this is where you see like this guy right here. This was someone was paying $3,000 for their ton per ton of Cabernet, but they were buying 581 tons. That's a lot of Cabernet. So 581 times 3,000. You know, you're looking at $1.7 million in just Cabernet. But if you're buying in bulk like that, you're probably going to get a bulk discount, most likely. Um, or that's someone who's farming that themselves. I mean, you also have this person just across the way that was paying $6,000 a ton for 853 tons of Cabernet. Oops, did my math wrong. 853 times 6,000. You're looking at just over $5 million in great purchases. So it ramps up really, really quickly. Here's a person buying 2,000 tons of Cabernet. I hear someone that's buying 1.5. So this report shows you a little bit of everything when it comes to what we're talking about, when it comes to purchasing grapes and how that realistically impacts us as businesses. Now, if we're paying that average and we're, you know, saying, hey, we're going to be spending at least $15 per bottle just on the fruit now we got to add in all that other stuff so it's uh it's a crazy report i love looking at this thing every year because all of a sudden it gives you perspective thank god i'm not the person paying 60 something thousand dollars per ton you know for that cabernet 
right? Because let's let's track that down. So we know that the average is about fifteen dollars a bottle. You know, cost is what you're spending, right? So sixty-seven thousand divided by two divided by three hundred. You're talking about one hundred and twelve dollars just for the grapes per bottle. That's your cost per bottle on just the grapes at that price. Now, if you're doing just basic like retail markups, we've talked a lot about this during the show, but if your basic retail markup is basically going to be a 50% margin. It's just keystone like retail pricing. For every bottle you sell, you can make two more, and that's how you kind of scale. That's not exactly how it works. You're going to have to figure, there's a lot of other factors in terms of how you structure your business, whether you're distributing that wine, whether you're just going direct to consumer and wine club and allocation, there's all kinds of other factors. But for the sake of just argument here, let's say that's what you're doing. You're just going to keystone price that you're going to market up as you see fit. So times two, you're looking at a $225 a bottle of wine with no other cost inputs, only the grapes. That's what you're looking at. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, where Napa has gone in the past 30 years in terms of grape prices, the prices of bottles of wine, uh, you know, what people are spending on bottles of wine and how much it actually costs to make those wines. I mean, on a really good day, on a really good day, I think you see folks in the high 20s in terms of margins, realistically. I mean, unless they're buying a lot of bulk wine and just kind of white label packaging stuff. That's a very different style of business. Um, that being said, I don't have, you know, direct access to a lot of other companies' financials. But it seems like if you're in that like 20 to 30 percent range, you're doing pretty damn good, especially if you're a small producer. If you're at scale and you're producing thousands of cases, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, you can work on smaller margins and say, hey, we're only making two dollars a bottle, but we're making a million bottles. So that's a cool two million profit right there. So the economy of scale starts to play into this as well. When you see that person buying like 800 tons of Cabernet, you're saying, okay, that's a big chunk of change. They're paying $6,000 per ton. So if you have, you know, which is $10 a bottle cost for that. So you're like, okay, if they can do that at that price, then perhaps they're selling a bottle of Cabernet in probably the you know, 40 to $50 range, they might be making a pretty good killing, or maybe they're selling it like a 30 to $40 range and not making a lot, but producing just an absolute bunch of it, right? Because at 853 tons, that person was buying, multiply that by two barrels, you're looking at 1700 barrels of Cabernet from that purchase. So I know I'm throwing out a bunch of numbers here, but this is where I get fired up because it's so exciting to see. So you have that person buying 853 tons, multiply that by two barrels. So you're looking at 1700 barrels of wine times 300 bottles. You're looking at half a million bottles of Cabernet right there. And if you're making, like I said, you're making, let's say, let's say you're making $3 a bottle on that. That's, you know, $1.5 million profit. <laughs> right? So that's how these economies of like scale really work within the wine industry is you sort through all this data that we have here. You figure out your averages, you haggle with your growers, you figure out what price you're paying. And now based on those raw materials, you can start, to, you know how much your glass is going to cost and labels and all this other stuff. You can put that into your lovely cost sheet like we have and say, all right, here's what it, you know, Here's what our bottom line is in terms of what it, we're spending to produce this wine. And now we can say, all right, here's our business plan of scaling up and where we want to be, uh, distribution channels we want to be in, if any, uh, whether we just want the wine to be wine club only or not. And you start to figure out, okay, what price point is most advantageous to grow as a small business or a large business within this industry based on stuff like this. Uh, this is probably you know, a little bit of review for some of you. I mean, many of you have probably made products or sold products or even your own time. Your time is technically a product that you're selling and your time is worth something. And you've done some sort of cost analysis to figure out, hey, what is actually worth my time and what do I need to charge in order for this to make financial sense for me, but also for the clients that I'm trying to, you know, pull in, right? So this is just... Oh, I love looking at this stuff because it really gives you some interesting and very finite data of like, hey, here's what's actually going on at like a 
base level within the wine industry and what people are spending just on grapes, just on the grapes. We're not even talking about anything else here. This is just grapes. Uh, it's an immense amount of perspective in terms of what's actually happening. Now, there's one more example that I want to dive into. And this really ties into the HBIC's wines, Blair Payton, uh, what Brittany has started over the last few years. And that is the production of Grenache in particular. Now, this is going to be kind of the difference between the price of grapes within Napa, but also the price of grapes within California and other regions as well. In fact, if we scroll all the way back here through this report, so I want you to remember this Napa average here that we've been looking at, this just over $9,000. And this is per ton of Cabernet that we've been talking about, right? Let's scroll back all the way to the California average. We got to go all the way back to page 10 here. Oh, that's right. I can actually type it in. Gosh, this is so handy. That's so much easier. I couldn't figure that out for the longest time. And I was like, man, it's going to be so weird just to have people watch and listen to me like scroll through a spreadsheet until I find the data I'm looking for. Turns out... The person who designed this is smarter than the average bear. All right, so let's zoom in on Cabernet here. Boop. So this Cabernet Sauvignon, here it is, the line item. And this is California's weighted average. So this is all of California, right? It includes Napa in this number. The Napa average is just over $9,000 per ton for Cabernet. If you come into just California on average, the entire state, the average price is $2,141. So the second you just move into Napa County, all of a sudden you're going to be paying three and a third times more, 3.3 times more the average price of California as a whole. And this is why you typically see wines from outside of Napa as it pertains to California as a whole be a little bit more affordable because the demand, frankly, isn't quite there. A lot of the quality isn't quite there. The rest of California, and this is a blanket term, so forgive me all you folks down south and in the El Dorado foothills and everywhere in the central coast, but a lot of it is farmed for yields not necessarily the highest quality, not necessarily the most complex. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody needs their Tuesday night affordable pizza wine that we call kind of the cellar protectors, right? Things that we can drink kind of at our leisure without having to worry about tapping into the really good stuff we've been hanging on to or collecting for the years that we've been into wine, right? So it kind of behooves us to have some kind of more cheaper and cheerful wines readily available. That way you guys don't have to worry about tapping into a $100 bottle of wine or even a $40 bottle of wine every time you want to dive in and have just a glass to kind of take the edge off the day. But how about that as a jump, right? Nine Over $9,000 a ton in Napa for California as a whole, just over $2,000 a ton. Whew, boy. So how does that factor into what Brittany's doing? Well, let's take a look, shall we? So on page, let's see, 74 here. This is Grenache in District 4, again in Napa. And you can see we have the averages here. The weighted average for Grenache, if we were to be buying it from Napa, would be about 4,300 a ton, right? So or let's call it 44. We'll round up just a little bit. Close enough. So at that stage, you're looking at a little about $7.33 per bottle just cost for those grapes. Now, if you're factoring, again, barrels, labels, corks, foils, all that jazz, that's going to start ratcheting up very, very quickly, right? And again, this is just the Napa average that we're talking about. So let's scroll down to where she's actually getting her grapes from. And this is one of the reasons why we're able to price the wines at a cheaper, more cheerful price. Her rosé being 26 bucks and her Grenache being $30 a bottle because we're not buying it from Napa. It's literally that simple because when you factor in all those other materials and the cost of doing business, it goes from that cost of 733 just for the grapes and it goes up pretty damn fast. So, but we can make the decision to say, hey, you know what? It'd be cool to have Napa Valley on the label, but frankly, to make the wines we want to make and make this business make sense for us financially, 
we need to find ways to cut costs. It's really that simple. So if we go down to page all the way down to 148, uh, this is district number 17. It's way out there in central California, closer to Sacramento, uh, where we're sourcing that Grenache from. And if we scroll down a little bit, you can see right here, here's the Grenache section, much more finite. There's only a little bit of Grenache being grown out there, but you can see the average price per ton for those grapes is just under $1,500. So if you take that 44 divided by 1500, we're paying almost three times less for those grapes, which means we don't have to charge three times more for it, theoretically. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that allows us to make wines that are a little bit more affordable. Now you say, okay, let's take this average, for example. And you're saying, all right, that rosé is 26 bucks a bottle. How do you go from, you know, that price to that $26 price point? And this is where we factor in, like we were saying earlier, all the labels, all the labor, all the corks, uh, glass, bottles, uh, just our costs of doing business, our expenses of going out on the road and doing events. A lot of her wines are actually sold through distribution, through retail shops and restaurants. And we obviously do not sell this wine to them at a retail price. We have to discount it at a wholesale or an FOB price, which we've talked about in past episodes, uh, which means you're basically discounting your wine at least 50% off, if not maybe around 33 or a third off for uh, down to like 33% or so. Uh, based on the retail value of that wine. So if I'm going to sell that wine to a distributor, you know, 26 bucks divided by, you know, two, that means I'm selling it to a distributor for $13 a bottle so that they can mark it up as they see fit. Now, if our average cost per bottle is, let's say, $9, and we're making $4 a bottle on that, right? Easy math. You're selling it for 13. It costs you nine to make, and you're making... 100 cases of it. So times 12 times 100. That's $4,800 in profit, right? Which covers a mortgage payment, basically, right? So there's your perspective of where things are kind of like priced and how they get priced within the wine industry, especially if you're working through like a distribution model. If you're going to be selling through a wholesaler or through a retailer or a restaurant, you're having to mark down your price quite a bit so they can get their cut, uh, which is why you see quite a few wines that are in distribution. You might even see them at a lower price than what you can buy them at the winery because they're just marking it up based on kind of their formula and what they want their margin to be. Uh, that's why we call it the three-tier system that we have to work with when it comes to, to pricing and working with distribution and getting into that realm. Uh, now, obviously, if she's making 200 cases of wine, let's say, so times two, that means the entirety of Blair Payton will net about $9,600 a year. I don't know what you know about the cost of living in California. You can't live a full year in California on $9,600. It's just not going to happen. So this is where, you know, talking about that economy of scale and making, you know, plans for growth into the future. It's like, okay. If that's kind of our baseline for 200 cases of wine, how much do we want to make to make this business more feasible, right? Do we want to do 10 times the amount? Do we want to make 2,000 cases of wine? That way it's closer to, you know, 100 grand a year. Uh, do we want to just make, do we just want to double that so that it's a little bit more profitable than where we want, where it is right now? That also means extra work, buying more materials, uh, making sure we have the space in our facility to do all those things. This is where you start getting really into kind of the big ticket conversation items of starting a wine brand, growing that wine brand, and realistically finding the demand you need to sell the wine you're making. Because you might still be, and luckily she does not have this problem, but you might be able to get a good deal on grapes but if you're having a hard time selling it and there's just a bunch of wine sitting in a warehouse, that's a problem. You need to kind of keep things moving a little bit, especially if you're making wines that are more, you know, let's say ready to drink rather than things you may want to you know, hold on to and age. And luckily we do a little bit of both those things within our program. So this is an absolutely fascinating report. Let me zoom back out here. 
Um, and I'll make sure that we have a link to this and you can basically see all of the data going all the way back to 1976. Oh, do we wanna look at that for a minute just because we can? Oh my gosh, look at this, hold on, I gotta zoom back out here. You can go back, oh, there's that, there it is. You can see it was a lot more simple. There were only 11 districts instead of 17. You had it kind of broken down here in the definition of districts. Oh my gosh, this is just absolutely crazy. Oh, look at all this old stuff. You can see table grapes, raisin grapes, wine grapes. Look what's being, look what was just being grown in this time. You got everything from, oh, the, the list of grape varieties that you have here is just absolutely fascinating. That is crazy. We're grown in comparisons. I don't even know if they have a pricing table for this. That'd be super cool to see what people were paying in 1976 for their grapes. Oh my gosh. This is a much shorter report. It's probably easier to go through. I hadn't even noticed this until recently and literally until just now. I'm like, oh, here we go. Dollars per ton. Perfect. Sonoma and Marin counties. There we go. I wonder if there's a Napa County section. Mendocino and Lake counties. Do, do, do. Oh, went too far. Bear with me here. Now I'm like sucked in. This is, I, I'm all about this. Napa County, here we go. Napa County in 1976. That is wild. There's not a great price over $400. Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, that's Solano County even. Where is it in Napa County? Oh my gosh, where is it? Oh, here we go. Now we're into the reds. Merlot was $675 a ton in 1976. That's crazy. Cabernet Sauvignon, you can see it's definitely the biggest section. But yet, there was no one paying more than $720 for a ton of Cabernet back in the day. How about that? The jump in 50 years. 50 years. That's crazy. 9,000. I got to do the math now. Divided by 720. That was the top end price. Man, in, in 50 years... Great prices have gone up 12 and a half times. And that's not even the average. That's just the high. That's just a high. That's not even the man. Crazy to think about where this where this valley was and where it has gone over the last 50 years. That's pretty wild. Um, and even with the, you know, substantial growth, almost 40 percent uh, in the last couple of years. Oof, been absolutely bonkers. All said and done. Um, I hope this shed a little bit of light on the overall kind of great market and, you know, what we contend with when it comes to purchasing grapes, kind of what we look for, you know, what we expect from our growers and the conversations that we have to have. Because um, there are plenty of times, and this happens all the time, where people see that high average of $9,000 a ton. They're like, oh, well, I have a vineyard in Napa. I'm going to sell it for 9000 And unfortunately, those vines aren't good enough to pay $9,000 a ton for. Uh, this is the exact issue we had with our Merlot last year, is that there were a lot of people asking a lot of money for Merlot grapes. And quite frankly, I was not impressed by the vineyards and nor was I gonna pull the trigger on buying those grapes because that juice just simply wasn't worth the squeeze when it's all said and done. Uh, this is, for all of you statistical geeks out there, this is gonna, you're gonna have a field day. If you're into, it's a, probably an interesting cross-section, a very niche thing to be that into numbers and be that into wine. But I tell you what, this report is worth looking at and then comparing it to some of these prior years like we did today, because uh, it's just absolutely wild to see the trends within California as a whole, but even, of course, where we're located, Napa specifically. So thank you all so, so much for tuning in. I hope you learned something and enjoyed this episode. Uh, it was definitely a lot of numbers getting thrown your way. I got really excited, so I apologize if I was talking a little fast there for a little bit. Uh, but this is super interesting stuff, and hopefully provides a little bit more kind of insider insight into what we deal with year in and year out when it comes to grape growing, grape purchasing, and eventually how that impacts the final product of wines that we're bottling, you know, years down the road when it's all said and done. Uh, please remember to follow us 
on all of our social networks at, at MTGA Wines. That's YouTube, Instagram, the Book of Face, and the social network formerly known as Twitter. Uh, please be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you're getting your podcast. It's a huge help to kind of spread the word and make it a little easier for people to find. I hope that you all have an amazing rest of the week. Thank you again so much for your patience since we had a couple of blank weeks there uh, due to storms and power outages and all that other stuff. Uh, really appreciate you all coming back and diving right into some of these grape economy details with us today. So we will see you next week. Until then, have a lovely day. Oh, I should mention, before I sign off officially, officially, uh, next week is the last Wednesday of the month. It'll be our February Q&A episode. So any questions that you want to have answered in terms of the wine industry, whether it be grape growing, grape purchasing like we covered today, uh, production, farming, hospitality, any of those things, you can slide into our DMs or just leave a comment on any of our social media posts. We'll be sure to try and tackle it during our Q&A. Uh, the more questions that are submitted, the better, because it keeps providing great content for you guys and hopefully the ability to you know, get a little bit more of an inside track on what's really going on out here in this crazy wine industry that we all love so much. All right. With that, take care. Take it easy. We'll catch you next time.